So today we're going to look at um, the 15th century Northern Renaissance. So the Northern Renaissance encompasses the Northern countries of Western Europe. So we're talking about um, sort of Northern France here, the Netherlands, and then Germany, which at the time was still part of the Holy Roman Empire. Now the artists here um, in the 15th century, they were still very much indebted to that late medieval style, that sort of aristocratic um, international Gothic style. Um, so you're going to see artworks that um, are very elegant and very ornate or decorative. And um, you're also going to see a lot of idealized or stylized depictions of figures and spaces and places. Um, the artists here were also very religious, although they do sort of show this growing interest in the natural world. And they do start to, in the 15th century, kind of uh, emphasize the individual personalities and sort of innovations and the desire to portray the everyday lives of people and sort of express pride within their own lands, their possessions, their successes, etc. So this Northern Renaissance is really going to be characterized by a great attention to detail, the use of rich, luminous colors, um, an effort to depict objects, animals, and people more accurately, more naturalistically, um, and a preoccupation with decoration, as well as a lot of symbolism. Illuminated manuscripts were among some of the most popular art objects during the 15th century. Now, manuscripts are simply handwritten books, um, and illuminations are lavish and decorative sort of illustrations of the text that were usually done in bright kind of luminous colors. Um, so wealthy patrons commissioned both religious texts and secular writings in this fashion. Now, <clears throat> a typical illuminated manuscript page might have a decorative border around the text, but more lavish books included full page miniature paintings that were set off with frames. And then these images were sort of conceived as windows into the scenes. So in the early 15th century in um, Northern Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, uh, some of the finest and most well-known painters were the Limburg brothers. Now these are three brothers, Hermann, Paul, and Jean from Limburg. And um, they were just teens at the beginning of the 15th century, but they very quickly became quite famous for their manuscript and their miniature painting uh, works. Um, so in about 1404, they entered into the service of their patron, the Duke Jean of Berry. He was the brother of King Charles V of France, um, and he was a very avid art patron and book lover. He commissioned tapestries, stained glass, paintings, sculptures, and he kept inventories uh, that recorded over 300 manuscripts within his possession. And some of the most famous or well-known, or maybe even some of the most important manuscripts that he owned uh, were created by these Limburg brothers. Um, so we're looking here at the Belle Urs of Jean de France, or the Duc de Berry. Now a Belle Urs is a book of hours. A Book of Hours was a prayer book that was used daily, and usually it included images that were meant to be sort of meditated upon during prayer. Now these were often quite richly decorated and detailed, and they were really intended for private devotion. Um, the owner of the prayer book, <clears throat> excuse me, was meant to be um, sort of using it and looking at these images up close rather than from far away as if you would look at um, a true painting. But the book would include set prayers to be given at different times, readings from the Gospels, and prayers to the Virgin. Um, now again, the brothers were teens when they created this particular book for the Duke of Bury, um, and it included seven quite luminous picture book insertions, uh, meaning uh, sort of seven double page, full page illustrations like you're seeing here. 
Um, and these depicted legends of the saints and hours of the Virgin. Um, so the scenes that we have here, we have on <clears throat> the left, the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel visits Mary and tells her that she will bear the Son of God. And then on the right, we have the Nativity scene or Christ's birth. Now here we have an even more ambitious project um, created by the Limbourg brothers in the service of the Duke of Bury. Um, this is Le Tres Riches U, or the Very Sumptuous Book of Hours. So this is um, another book of hours, it's just even more lavish than the previous one. Um, so this was completed in about 1411 to 1416, um, and it contained prayers and devotions as well as a calendar of holy days. Now this was not a calendar that was specific to any single year, but it was um, sort of a calendar that was meant to track the sun using the chariot as it flies across the sky. And then we also have um, the signs of the zodiac being depicted in the sky as well. So each, page includes um, full page illustrations. We've got scenes in sort of the bottom uh, two thirds of each page that depict um, illustrations for each month of the year. And one page will depict peasant laborers during a certain month. And then the other page will depict aristocratic pleasures during that same month. So sort of comparing the two classes in the same time periods of the year. Um, and then in the upper third of each page, we've got that calendar. So um, you can see the signs of the zodiac in the sky at different points of the year. And you can also see uh, the chariot of the sun kind of moving across the sky and how it's in different locations at different points in the year. Um, so we're looking here at um, the February and January illustrations. So this is um, in the midst of winter. And if you notice, we have two very different um, sets of activities happening here. The peasant laborers are working on their farm. They are working quite hard to ensure that they'll have enough food to get them through this winter. Um, we have the, the ladies of the home kind of sitting within this very small, simple house, kind of lifting the hems of their dresses to allow the heat from the fire to warm them. Uh, and then we have other members of the family still out doing work. Um, it's a very sort of bleak, um, realistic depiction of what life might have been like for these people during the cold winter months. Uh, but then on the other side, we have the Duke of Bury himself seated at this large sort of feast table with all of these other aristocrats kind of um, having a party. There's um, a lot of elaborate food in front of them. And in fact, if you notice, they have so much food that this man is sort of feeding some of it to the dog down here. And then we have another little dog who has hopped up on the table to help himself. And no one around seems to care or even notice. Um, we also have in the background some tapestries of war, so this is probably a, a, a celebration feast, um, but it's a sort of an interesting juxtaposition. We have, you know, the same bleak, cold winter months being depicted here, but where the aristocrats are, you know, thriving, they have plenty of food, plenty of warmth, um, they're having a good time. Here we have the peasants who are struggling. And I don't know, some are, some historians have argued that the peasants here are depicted as being somewhat lowly, maybe uncivilized or um, kind of simplistic. Um, meanwhile, again, the Duke of Bury is, you know, very lavish having this celebratory, elaborate feast. Um, now again, notice this was completed sometime around 1416. This is the same year that the Black Plague uh, struck Europe. And we do believe that all three of the Limburg brothers um, died of the Black Plague. Um, and so they would have been probably less than 30 years old at the time of their death. I mentioned altarpieces in the Proto-Renaissance lecture just briefly, and so let me go back a minute and sort of explain what an altarpiece is and why it's important. Now, in the medieval period, panel paintings, or quite literally paintings made on panels, usually of wood, um, 
these were once almost exclusive to the church. Um, however, in the early 15th century, they were really gaining importance. Um, a panel painting, it was a pretty flexible medium. You could add additional panels or maybe remove them. You could repaint them and they could be um, carried around. They were rather portable. And so altarpieces or panel paintings for the altar of a church really became some of the most important liturgical objects commissioned by churches in the early 15th century. They were considered educational tools and they were used as icons to sort of inspire devotion. Now we will also start to see, particularly in this northern renaissance period, um, domestic altarpieces becoming more common. Now the domestic ones were generally a bit smaller, while church altarpieces were larger and more elaborate. Um, but again, you can have an altarpiece that is two paneled and it usually folds kind of in the middle there. Um, this is called a diptych. You can also have a three paneled altarpiece called a triptych. And so you have a larger central panel most often and then two smaller wings or side panels, again, folding kind of at the, um, at the crease there. Um, and then this is a slightly more elaborate version of a triptych. And so domestic altarpieces are typically a bit smaller and a little bit more simple like these. Um, you're going to see single panels, diptychs, and triptychs in the domestic um, contexts. For more elaborate church altarpieces, um, this style is going to be a bit more common. And then even this um, sort of more intricate version that has even more than three panels. Uh, we call this a polyoptic when it has more than three uh, panels like this. And again, the wings are typically movable. They can usually be at least opened and closed, but sometimes they can be removed and even rearranged. And then oftentimes, uh, you can't really see one here, but oftentimes there will also be sort of an additional um, bottom panel across the bottom part of the wings and the altarpiece itself. Um, that is called a predea. So panel paintings were especially popular in Flanders. Flemish art and artists were admired across Europe throughout the 15th century. Artists abroad studied Flemish works and their influence spread even to Italy. It wasn't until the end of the 15th century that the general preference for Netherlandish painting was replaced by the new styles of art and architecture developing in Italy. Now, Flemish panel painters preferred using oil paints rather than the standard temper paint favored by the Italians. Now, paint at its most basic is pigment suspended in some sort of liquid binder that dries after application and adheres the pigment to the surface. Tempera paint is traditionally pigment mixed with an egg binder, and it works best when it's mixed fresh. Tempera is opaque and fast drying. It's usually painted in short, quick brush strokes. It lends itself to careful details and it retains its brilliant coloration over time. However, tempera paints are not easily blended. They're not conducive to slow working or erasing mistakes, and they dry matte, and so they can look a bit dull. Oil paint, on the other hand, um, it initially appeared in the medieval period, but it really took off and spread throughout Europe during the 15th century. It utilizes oil as a binder, particularly linseed oil, which is a byproduct of the flax plant when it's used to produce linen, which was a major commodity in the Netherlands at the time. Oil paint dries much more slowly than temper paint, meaning that it's reworkable. Mis mistakes, excuse me, mistakes can be edited, scrubbed out, or repainted entirely, even days after the initial application. Oil paint is also more translucent than tempera, meaning that it allows more light to shine through. Using oils, artists can build up thin layers of paint called glazes that essentially capture light and give the paint a luminous quality as if it's lit from within. 
Flemish panel painters, much like manuscript illuminators, sought to create windows into scenes with a keen attention to individualized features. And so they used um, oils and tiny paintbrushes to achieve high levels of minute details to create a sort of realistic style that really reveals their heightened interest in observing nature and everyday life. And they create compositions that really look natural, but are still full of symbolic meaning. So here we have a small oak triptych. This is about two by four feet, um, and it is oil paint on these oak panels. But this was made for private or domestic use by an artist long referred to as the Master of Flamel, or the Master of Flanders, um, and he's now been ID'd as Robert Campen. Now this is called the Marode Altarpiece. It was named after um, some of its later owners, but it's a great example of this early 15th century Flemish style. So we have a central panel here that depicts the Annunciation scene. We have the angel Gabriel appearing to the Virgin Mary to tell her she will bear the Son of God. Um, however, this is sort of unique in that it is set within a contemporary 15th century Flemish home. And the artist has incorporated very, or several, excuse me, common household objects within the scene that also have um, a lot of symbolic sort of religious meaning. Um, so there's a really rich iconographic reading of this scene. Um, some historians refer to it as disguised symbolism because we as you know viewers of this painting now would look at these objects and see objects but we wouldn't necessarily know what the symbolism of the objects was um, right off the tops of our heads. Whereas in um, 15th century Flanders viewers would um, have automatically understood the meaning here. So we have Mary sitting um, to the right, kind of on a footrest, so she's a bit lower. Um, this is meant to symbolize her humility or her submission to God. She's holding a prayer book and maybe a little prayer shawl or towel as well, again, to show her devotion. She's wearing red, which is a color that symbolizes royalty, the power of the church, the blood of Christ, um, martyrdom, or maybe just her suffering as the mother of Christ. Um, now, again, we have Gabriel, who's sort of kneeling towards Mary as if he's just kind of come into the room and he's still in the process of stopping fully. Um, and that is um, sort of that idea is sort of furthered by the fact that the pages of the book on the table are sort of flipping in the wind. We also have this candle here and you can sort of see some smoke coming up off of it as if it's just recently been extinguished. Um, an extinguished candle like this um, can also symbolize the divine presence of God or the Holy Spirit. Um, now in the background and um, you know kind of on the table as well, we have some other objects with religious symbolism here. Um, so in the background in the wall, we have this niche in which we have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have this uh, little cauldron or pitcher, probably of holy water hanging here. And then next to the niche, we have another white uh, prayer shawl. Um, we have the vase or the pitcher on the table as a vessel for these flowers. Um, Mary is the vessel of God, so there's sort of a symbolic um, connection here as well. And then the flowers themselves are white. Um, they're white lilies. Lilies are associated with humility and devotion, and then the color white is meant to symbolize the Virgin's purity, her innocence, and her goodness. Um, and then there's also one more little detail that we need to zoom in to see here. So streaming in from the window in the top of the wall, we have these small rays of light, but sort of floating in on those small rays of light, we have this tiny kind of um, infant Christ 
flying in towards, we can't see her anymore, but towards um, his mother Mary. He carries the cross over his shoulder, so perhaps this is meant to sort of symbolize, again, the Holy Spirit or the presence of God, um, but also this is you know, the Annunciation scene. Gabriel is here to say, you will bear the Son of God, and here comes this little fetal Son of God towards his soon-to-be mother. Now we also have two side panels here. Um, let's look at the side panel on the, well, our right, but it would be the, the left panel here, I suppose. Um, but our right, we have a male character kind of working in a small little wood shop maybe. This is meant to be Joseph and Joseph was a carpenter so this is his little carpenter's workshop. He is busy working on a little project here. He has sort of this drill that he seems to be using on a little plank of wood. Um, potentially he's drilling holes to create a wine press um, which would potentially then be symbolic of the blood of Christ. Um, we also have you know, some other projects and tools and things. One of the projects back here on the table has been interpreted as a mouse trap, and um, some scholars refer to the story of St. Augustine identifying the cross as the devil's mouse trap, and so they sort of make that into a symbol of, you know, catching evil or, or God or Jesus kind of trapping and stopping the devil. Um, but then in the background, we have this, again, a contemporary scene kind of through the window there of a thriving 15th century Flemish city. So we have, you know, the incredible amount of detail within the uh, primary scene, but then we have this incredible amount of sort of microscopic detail within the background as well. And then, you know, the contemporary aspect of both the interior and this exterior scene. I think those those aspects really allow for 15th century Flemish viewers to kind of um, have a familiar setting for this supernatural event to happen within, and it really allows them to relate to it a bit more closely, I, I think. Um, now in the opposite um, wing or the opposite side panel, we have kind of an exterior walled garden or courtyard. This is meant to be the door to this uh, Flemish home and it is open ever so slightly so that these two individuals who are kneeling just outside the door can sort of peer through it and watch the events of um, the Annunciation here. Now this is what we call the donor wing because these two kneeling individuals are the donors or the patrons. They are the people who commissioned this um, triptych initially. They're the ones who paid for it to be created and it was a pretty common thing for the donors to be included in the scene um, in such, a, in such a fashion here. So they are being included in the action. Um, they're again, kind of washing through the door um, from this enclosed garden, which also is sometimes read as a symbol for Mary's purity or her virginity as well. And so all of this is a very contemporary, kind of relatable or understandable scene for that 15th century Flemish viewer but it's also highly symbolic and just loaded with religious uh, kind of meaning. Now, if we sort of step back and look at this formally, you can really pick up on some of the, um, some of the characteristics of oil paint. We have this sort of luminous quality of the colors. It really seems like uh, light is emanating from within the painting in a lot of ways. You can really pick up on the subtle kind of uh, pink or red coloration of the cheeks that really brings this sense of warmth and of life to the figures. Um, we've got a use of sort of subtle light and shadow to help model the figures and create this sense of volume and three-dimensionality. Um, and that carries over into the space that they occupy as well. Um, however, it's not a perfect sense of space, right? Um, the sense of perspective is a little bit off. The bench here recedes into space as if to suggest it's getting further away. However, the angle is not totally um, perfect, so it seems that the bench is maybe a bit long for the room. Um, then we have this oval table that again has been sort of 
um, tilted to imply that it is receding into space, although it's not quite right. Again, we can sort of see too much of the top of it and then a lot of the side of it all at the same time. So um, we're still a little bit off in perspective. Um, note the size of Gabriel. He's kneeling. So imagine if he were to stand up straight, I think he would probably hit his head on the rafters here. So, um, you know, the proportions, the perspective, these kinds of things are not, not quite um, you know, perfect yet, but we're definitely seeing some some advancements and a greater sense of naturalism, a greater interest in depicting reality as it's truly seen, um, even though we're still kind of hanging on to that symbolic um, content as well. So the true master painter of the North during the early 15th century was Jean Van Eyck. Um, now, he's sometimes credited with the invention of oil painting, but that's not actually true. Um, it was already around by his time. His skill in handling it, however, definitely had a sort of profound influence on its popularity throughout Europe. Um, so we're looking here at a work titled Man in a Red Turban from about 1422, and this is commonly interpreted as a self-portrait. Um, so here the artist is really using light and shade in a sort of a subtle yet dramatic way. We have um, the sitter that seems to really emerge from the darkness, um, and his face and his headdress have truly been modeled by the light, um, which seems to be coming in from the left. So the the painting really seems to have one single consistent light source, um, and you can really get a sense of the subtle gradation of values, this kind of use of light and shadow to suggest, again, that volume and that three-dimensionality. So this is not, you know, a flat cutout pasted onto a background. Rather, this is um, sort of a fully volumetric form um, within its own little scene or its own little uh, space. Now, the viewer has really drawn our attention towards the image through this really penetrating gaze, and then he's really captured um, the naturalistic details of the figure as well. Notice the wrinkles around the eyes and kind of the um, the sense that we have this sort of thin skin in the bags under the eyes as well. We have kind of a tightness around the mouth, um, a bit of a wrinkle here and underneath as well. Um, and we can also get a sense of a sort of redness in the eyes as well, as if his eyes are sort of bloodshot, um, which imagine a person painting a self-portrait in the 15th century would have had to have spent a pretty long amount of time kind of staring in the mirror and then looking at their panel and then back to the mirror, back to the panel. But I imagine it was sort of a long, arduous process that would result in bloodshot eyes. So maybe this is, you know, a true... Uh, realistic detail here. Um, again, though, you can see some of the qualities of oil paint here because look how subtle this blush to his cheek has been included here, um, how subtly that's been included here, and, and it just brings this sense of warmth and of life to this figure. Now, the light source, back to that, this source really seems to shine into this painting as if it's from our reality. Notice how um, we have this frame around our scene. The frame here is actually painted. It's not a true frame, despite the fact that it looks like it. This is what we call trompe l'oeil, or a trick of the eye, something that is painted so sort of illusionistically natural that we really believe it to be real. Um, and so the way in which Jean Van Eyck has kind of treated that area of the painting and kind of included these very bright highlights as if the light source is coming from our reality and shining into this painting and catching the edge of the three-dimensional frame and casting a shadow or causing this highlight. Uh, when in reality, it's all flat. This is all flat oil paint on panel. And then down here at the bottom, we also have this faux inscription. It looks to be um, engraved into this frame, a little bit at the top here as well. Um, but again, this is all flat oil paint on panel. Now across the bottom there, um, 
the inscription says als ich kann or as I can, as Ike can. And um, this is sort of taken from a common phrase at the time, as I can, but not as I would. Um, maybe this is meant to be Jean Van Eyck's way of sort of self-promoting. He's sort of showing off his skill and his ability as an oil painter, showing the, again, the characteristics and kind of the, the pros of using oil paints, how it can be built up in those thin layers of glaze and kind of create this rich, luminous feeling, um, bring that really, or excuse me, bring that sense of naturalism really kind of into the painting. Um, so maybe this self-portrait was all about showing off his skill and uh, trying to get himself more commissions. So here we're looking at the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, this was the most famous work of Van Eyck's during his lifetime. Uh, it's a huge polyeptic. It was actually began by his brother Hubert, and then after his brother died, Jan Van Eyck picked it up and kind of finished it off. Um, this was commissioned by the mayor of the city of Ghent for his family chapel. And it's, it's sort of characterized by this impressive three-dimensionality of the figures, the volume and surface realism of the fabric, and the high a level of attention given to details here. Um, the scenes are, again, religious in subject matter. However, Jean Van Eyck really works to kind of emphasize the humanity of the scene rather than the divinity or the supernatural aspect. Now we're looking at the exterior of the altarpiece. This is what it looks like when it's closed. And so here we have another Annunciation scene in kind of this upper register. And then in the lower register, we have our patrons again. So this man here kneeling in the red robe, kneeling in prayer, this would be the mayor of Ghent. Um, and then here is his wife across on the opposite side. And then between them, we have John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. These would have been the patrons saints of Ghent and of this church, um, and they've been depicted here as uh, sort of classical marble sculptures. Now, in this upper register with the Annunciation scene, um, we have sort of a, an expansive scene with the Angel Gabriel to the left and the Virgin Mary to the right. Um, again, Gabriel seems to be uh, sort of sweeping into the room as if he's just arrived, although I feel like we have a greater sense of stillness than we saw in uh, Robert Campin's Marode altarpiece. Um, but this time, Gabriel's message to Mary has been painted in. You can sort of see an inscription here. Um, Gabriel says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Um, Mary on the other side, she crosses her um, hands at the wrists, sort of across her chest here. Here's a devotion book or a book of the gospel in the background. Um, and she's sort of glancing upwards as if looking towards the heavens. And we do actually have this dove here kind of right above her head, which is often interpreted as a symbol of the Holy Ghost or kind of the divine presence of God. Um, her reply to Gabriel has also been painted in. She says, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. However, it's painted in upside down. Um, why might that be? Well, Jan van Eyck knows that um, she may be responding within the scene to Gabriel, but in reality, her answer was to God himself. And so he's painted this upside down as if to suggest she is speaking directly to God or maybe even to the Holy Spirit here. And so her message is being sent uh, upward towards the heavens. Um, and then our final kind of small register at the top of the panel here. Um, these smaller scenes include prophets and sibyls um, that are reading the prophecies of Christ. Um, these are featured within the Old Testament. And so here is what it looks like on the inside or when it's open. And so um, it would generally be opened for Sundays and for feast days. And so the interior is full of this brilliant color and really we have a whole different mood. It's really lively and full of action versus the sort of um, somber, quiet mood on the exterior. Um, so we have two registers this time, kind of a upper register and a lower register. Um, so let's look at the upper register first. So we have God the Father in the middle here in this red robe. He's wearing the 
papal crown or the pope's crown, um, kind of the crown of heaven. And then we have this other kind of um, more earthly royal crown at his feet. And, and actually, let's zoom in on him just quickly here. So when we zoom in, you can really see that attention to minute detail that Jean van Eyck is so well known for. Um, you can see how he's utilized the translucent layers of oil paint to kind of build up this subtle uh, flush to the cheeks and this highlight of the nose here, um, and to kind of use that uh, gradation of values to create that sense of volume within the face. So you can really see how um, we have sort of these bags under his eyes and little wrinkles around his eyes. Um, you can really almost pick out individualized hairs within his beard here as well. And note how we have all of this detail within the jewels and kind of um, a patterning of all of his regalia and adornment here. Um, I also want to point out that in this brocade or this kind of fabric panel behind God, um, it is a golden pattern on sort of a navy blue background, but the pattern itself is um, it, it features a female pelican feeding her babies, feeding her children. And so according to stories, apparently when there is no food to be found, a mother pelican will pick the flesh off of her own body to feed her young. And so it's interesting that this is incorporated here. It's probably meant to be a symbol for Christ's sacrifice uh, to allow new life to be given uh, to humanity, kind of that sacrifice for uh, the forgiveness of sin. All right, so returning to the full panel here. So God the Father gives a gesture of blessing right in the center. Um, and then we have John the Baptist and the Virgin Mary on either side of him, reading from books of the gospel. Again, pick up on that kind of subtle use of light and shadow and the luminous quality of oil paint that is evident within the folds of the fabric on each figure. Um, the next panel on either side, we see um, saints and angels, uh, the hosts of heaven, essentially singing the praises of God. And then on the ends, we have Adam on the left and Eve on the right. Now, these are depicted in relatively naturalistic um, nude figures. And actually, let's zoom in on these again. So again, the, the depictions of Adam and Eve are quite naturalistic. In fact, Adam looks to have been uh, kind of painted using a live model and really see the attention to detail in the musculature and the anatomy of the body. And notice too how we have this one leg kind of stepping outward into space so that his toes sort of just, um, they sort of extend over the edge of this frame as if to suggest he's really stepping out into space. Um, Eve, however, is a bit more stylized, not quite as naturalistic. She seems to be um, sort of stylized to represent traditional feminine qualities. Um, now, maybe that is to sort of suggest that, you know, she is the mother of all. Uh, maybe he's depicted her with this kind of protruding abdomen as if to suggest she's pregnant as a way to emphasize that. Um, or maybe this is just how Jean Van Eyck depicted women. Maybe he's um, sort of again, more stylized or more generalized here. Now, why would Adam and Eve be included in a scene like this one? Well, there's often considered to be a parallel in art between Eve and Mary, uh, the mother of all humanity and the mother of Christ, and then a parallel between Adam and Christ. Now, the, that parallel is not really perfect here, but that is the reason for their inclusion. Adam and Eve are sort of responsible for the introduction of sin, uh, the fall of mankind, and therefore for death. Um, and then the idea that life comes again through Mary as the mother of Christ, and then through Jesus and his sacrifice. So now let's look at the bottom register here. So we have five panels across the bottom register, and these are all 
meant to be the same space. So we have this continuous kind of horizon line across the landscape here that's meant to unify all five of these panels. Um, and so we have this kind of landscape that has meadows and forests. We can see sort of cities in the distance along that continuous horizon. Now at the front right of our group here, we have um, apostles and martyrs gathering. At the front left, we have Old Testament characters and pagans. Uh, behind them to the left, we have confessors. To the right in the back, we have the virgins. Um, on the right side panel, we have hermits and pilgrims. Um, and then on the right, or excuse me, on the left side panel, we have judges and warriors. So all of these individuals, all of these people have gathered within this landscape, all to witness what's happening kind of in the center of the larger panel here. Um, so let's zoom in on that. Um, so what's going on right here in the center? We have a lamb on an altar. In front of that altar, we have um, a cross being held by these angels who are sort of encircling the altar itself. And if you notice, the lamb is wounded and it's spurting blood sort of out of its chest into a golden chalice that's sat on the edge of the altar there. So ultimately, this is symbolic um, for Christ as the Lamb of God um, and his sacrifice that again allows for new life um, so ultimately the blood kind of leads down to this fountain here which is meant to be the fountain of life and again a symbol for christ's sacrifice signifying new life now an interesting sort of fact about the Ghent altarpiece, it was famously stolen by the Nazis and stored in a salt mine um, and then recovered in 1945. Now after its recovery, it was cleaned and restored. And during the restoration, um, it was revealed that the lamb uh, actually has this very kind of human-like facial expression and especially in the eyes, very human-like eyes. And that really creates this sort of strong emotional pull with the viewer. And I think further emphasizes the fact that the lamb is meant to be a symbol for Christ, kind of speaking to the humanity, um, yet also the wisdom um, and strength of Christ. And then I've thrown this image in just to give you a sense of scale for this altarpiece. So while the Ghent altarpiece was probably the most famous of his works during his lifetime, the Arnolfini portrait is certainly the most famous of Van Eyck's works today. Now this portrait is done in mesmerizing detail, and it shows a man and a woman joined at the hands um, in this bedroom. Now the identity of this couple is not known for sure, but the original scholarship identified them as Giovanni and Giovanna Arnolfini. Um, Giovanni Arnolfini was a wealthy banker for the Medici branch in Bruges, um, and then Giovanna would have been his wife. She would have also been from a socially prominent family, um, but the wealth of the couple is obvious within this uh, scene. We've got rather lavish bedding, lavish fabrics in their clothing as well. Um, the man here is shown wearing velvet and fur. Um, I believe the woman wears velvet as well. You can really get a sense of kind of the implied textures of these fabrics. They seem to be heavy, kind of um, falling very heavily in the deep folds of the drapery there. You can also see their wealth in the golden chandelier that hangs from the ceiling. We have this sort of oriental imported carpet back here. Um, we've got oranges on this table and in the window seal. Um, these would have been pretty rare and pretty expensive because, again, they would have had to have been imported. Um, notice the attention giving to the individualizing kind of features of the man. He seems to be, um, you know, maybe identifiable based on his appearance. He has a rather uh, large nose, kind of small eyes, kind of thin lips. 
Um, the woman, however, on the other hand, is more stylized. Again, she's certainly less individualized. She seems to be more like a doll, kind of a, a generalization of women. She's wearing this large white veil over her hair. You can see her hair just a little bit right here. Um, this is a symbol of her piety. And then she has this sort of soft facial expression with downward cast eyes. This is an appropriate kind of expression or or posture for women of the time um, versus her husband who is sort of more frontally posed so that he's facing or confronting the viewer more directly. Um, we also have just an incredibly high amount of precision and detail within the scene. Um, we have lots of naturalism, but we also have lots of symbolism that really helps us interpret what's going on here. So this is traditionally interpreted as documentation of a wedding or of the engagement of this couple. Um, lots of the objects within the scene can relate or can be related, excuse me, to ideas of fertility, uh, fidelity, the sacrament of marriage, or to um, various religious themes. So notice that the figures do not have shoes on. Um, the man's shoes are shown down here in kind of the lower corner. Um, the removal of one's shoes is a symbol of standing on holy or sacred ground. Um, this would have been done to maybe honor the sacrament of marriage. Um, we've got a little broom hanging from the bedpost back here, maybe meant as a symbol of domesticity. Um, the little dog down here in the foreground, first of all, note the incredible amount of detail. Um, you can kind of pick out individualized hairs from his little wiry coat. Um, you can see kind of the details of his face. I, I love this little dog so much. Um, but Symbolically, the dog can be interpreted as um, kind of representing loyalty or fidelity. Uh, dogs are faithful, and maybe this is meant to speak to the fidelity of marriage. Oranges not only symbolize wealth, but they might also symbolize fertility as well. Um, and, you know, many scholars have interpreted the female figure here as being pregnant because of the way her dress sort of billows out and her hand is kind of placed almost protectively over her abdomen. Um, so some argue that she is pregnant. Uh, others argue that this is a depiction meant to kind of manifest pregnancy or to express the hope for pregnancy. Um, maybe it was painted as an allusion to the fertility of this couple and their um, their desires to start a new family. The color red in the bedding and kind of in the background fabrics would also maybe symbolize ideas of fertility as well. Um, but again, if you think back to the way that Jan van Eyck depicted Eve in the Ghent altarpiece, this might simply be the way that he depicts his women in sort of a generalized or a stylized way. Um, however, there is also back here on the bedpost again, um, kind of carved out of the top of the bedpost there is a small figure that has been interpreted as Saint Margaret, who was considered the protector of women during childbirth. So um, that also sort of hints at pregnancy. Um, or a hoped pregnancy, at least. Now, there's also a lot of religious symbolism here. We have one candle in the chandelier that is lit. This might be to symbolize the divine presence of God. Um, the natural light kind of streaming in the window can also be interpreted um, as the divine presence of God sometimes. We have prayer beads hanging on the wall next to a mirror back here. Um, prayer beads maybe to symbolize the piety or faith of the couple. And then the mirror itself is sometimes interpreted as being sort of a symbol of the all-seeing eye of God. Um, but let's zoom in on the mirror just for a second. So surrounding the convex mirror itself within this frame, we have these small vignettes um, all the way around. These are actually depicting scenes from um, the Passion of the Christ. So again, kind of 
religious symbolism and maybe that supports the idea that the mirror is meant to reflect the the presence of god or his knowledge um however let's talk about the mirror in a more secular kind of context um first it has just again this amazing level of detail and skill um the artist has included the reflection of the room within the mirror you can see the bed you can see the window the table with the oranges and you can see the backs of the figures within the room so here's the man here's the woman but guess what we actually can see the reflections of a couple other figures within the room we seem to have two more people standing um, towards the back of the room um, maybe these are meant to be reflections of us of the viewer um, but I think it's more likely that we have a reflection of the priest or the person kind of overseeing the union of these two individuals and then probably a reflection of the artist himself of Jean Van Eyck so um, he's included himself within the reflection there suggesting he's actually here painting the scene as it happens now he's also included his signature on the wall above the mirror however he's not just included his name he has included a phrase that says jean van eyck was here 1434. why would he say that he was here and not that he you know painted this again i think that suggests that this is in fact his reflection and that maybe he's here serving as a witness to this marriage contract or to this um, wedding. Um, and then the, the signature is not only him signing his artwork, but his signature as a witness of these events as well. I've included the image on the right here again, just to give you a sense of scale. This is a quite small painting and I think that makes the incredible level of minute detail just even more impressive um, but more recent research has shown that Giovanni and Giovanna Arnolfini were not actually married until 1447 which would have been after this painting was created and after Jean van Eyck was already dead um, maybe this was a situation in which the painting was created in advance uh, to secure the dowry or to serve as some sort of contract for the engagement. Um, but some scholars now think that it's more likely that this is not Giovanni and Giovanna, but rather Giovanni and his first wife, um, and that it is sort of a memorial portrait um, to his first wife, who had died about one year prior to the creation of this, so in about 1433, um, during childbirth. So maybe this is a way to sort of commemorate his first wife, um, to remember her, or again, maybe this was a way to sort of um, to sort of express his hope for um, a greater level of fertility and kind of a, a healthy pregnancy and birth within his new marriage. Another important oil painting virtuoso of the 15th century Northern Renaissance is Roger van der Weyden. Now, we don't actually know a lot about Roger van der Weyden. We do know that he likely studied under the master of Flamel, but um, he actually became the official painter of Brussels. Um, we don't have a lot of paintings that can be, um, you know, certainly attributed to him, but this is the most uh, sort of confidently attributed of his paintings and probably the most famous that is associated with him. This is his deposition from the cross. Um, this is a rather large painting. Um, it's about seven feet three inches by about eight feet seven inches. So the figures here are very nearly life size, but he's incorporated these 10 figures kind of squeezed into this tight space. Um, and so the deposition is the removal of Christ's body from the cross. So that is the moment that we're seeing here. Um, notice that he's incorporated this uh, sort of Byzantine um, flat gold background here. However, 
we still have a sense of sort of depth and space within the painting due to his use of light and shadow and kind of the ways in which he's treated the colors and the variations of color and value within the painting. Um, we really get a sense of depth and a sense of volume and three-dimensionality within the figures as well. Um, so John the Evangelist kind of leans to catch a fainting Virgin Mary who is kind of overcome with grief as her son is being removed from the cross. Um, notice the swoop of Christ's body kind of matches the swoop of Mary's body. So we have this sense of repetition, kind of creating a, a rhythm and, and a sense of unity within the painting. Um, and Mary's fainting here is sort of a foreshadowing of Christ's resurrection. Um, he will return to life despite the fact that he is dead at this moment. Um, to the right, we have Mary Magdalene who sort of bends under her grief and places her hands uh, kind of tightly together, perhaps in prayer or perhaps in sort of a very human um, motion, kind of wringing her hands in, in grief there. Um, but she's also meant to sort of balance all of the action happening on the left hand side of the painting. Um, Again, the figures are sort of pushed to the front of the picture plane um, because of that flat gold background. Um, and, and, you know, the, the gold background really allows Roger van der Weyden to avoid any kind of problems of perspective kind of correctness. Um, it forces us as viewers to really address the immediate emotionality and to notice the details included within the figures. I mean, notice the red noses, notice especially here with this um, woman in kind of the background, her red nose, her red eyes, um, and how she's dabbing at her eyes as if she's wiping away tears and we can really see the effect of her emotion on her physical form. Um, but you can also pick up on the luminosity of oil paint and um, the attention to detail as well. Um, this is overall a very emotional kind of portrait of just heartrending grief, but also a nice example of this um, 15th century Northern Renaissance uh, painting style. And lastly, we have a work by Hugo van der Goh. Um, Hugo van der Goh was the Dean of the Painters Guild in Ghent, and he sort of combines the intellectual qualities of Jean van Eyck with the emotional sensitivity of Roger van der Weyden. Um, so this particular work is the Adoration of the Shepherds or the Portinari Altarpiece from about 1474 to 1478. Um, it's a nativity scene commissioned by Tommaso Portinari, who was a wealthy Italian banker and a representative of the Medici family here in Bruges. Um, he commissioned this for his family chapel in Florence. So this would have been one of the early works of Northern Renaissance art that made its way down to Italy. Um, this is quite large again, it's about eight feet tall. And so for many Italians, this would have been the, their first look at Flemish oil painting um, and kind of their first exposure to these tiny brush strokes and the luminous glazes. Now on the left wing, we have um, Tommaso and his son with the saints, uh, Anthony and Thomas. Um, and then in the right wing, we have Tommaso's wife and daughter with the saints Mary Magdalene and Margaret. Now in the central panel, we have our nativity scene, um, but this is meant to be sort of a continuous narrative again. You can look across the background and see this continuous landscape running across all three panels there. Um, and so in the background, in kind of the side panels, we have moments of the narrative um, that happened earlier in the story being depicted as the, at the same time as the nativity scene. So for example, on the left in kind of the background on this rocky outcropping here, we have some figures. These are meant to be Mary and Joseph as they are traveling towards Bethlehem. Um, Mary can be seen dismounting from her donkey. Um, to the right in the background, we have another path kind of leading in from the distance. Um, these are the three magi on their way um, to see the newly born Christ child. So they're on their way to the central scene as well. 
Now, in the central scene, we have the infant Christ kind of lying on the ground, surrounded by angels, by saints, shepherds, and then we have Mary um, and Joseph as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The light of the spirit is sort of emanating from the Christ child as well, kind of emphasizing his divinity. Um, although we also are sort of emphasizing his humanity he's placed directly on the ground in sort of a humbling way rather than in a manger or in a crib or something um but notice mary's kind of appearance here rather than being ecstatic at the birth of her son she sort of takes a more solemn appearance as if she already knows about the events to come in her son's life so I've zoomed in on the central panel here to talk about symbolism again. We have um, lots of seemingly ordinary objects within this scene that carry a lot of um, sort of religious symbolic meaning. So for starters, we have in the foreground kind of this bundle of wheat. Wheat is, of course, used to make bread. And this scene is taking place in the city of Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And of course, Christ's body is considered to be the bread of life. Now, in front of the wheat, we have a couple of vessels of flowers. The vessel on the left is decorated with grapes and grape vines, sort of referencing wine and how it's used as um, the blood of Christ during communion. Um, this vessel holds a red lily. Um, lilies are again symbols of humility and devotion, while the color red is symbolic of Christ's blood, um, again to go with the grapes and the grapevines. Um, it also holds three irises. One of them is purple to symbolize Christ's royal ancestry, and the others are white to symbolize purity. Um, now the other vessel holds these little blue flowers. These are columbines and they're meant to symbolize Mary's future sorrows. And then on the ground, kind of sprinkled, we have these purple violets, which also symbol humility. Now back here in um, kind of the, um, the um, stable or the barn, um, we have this large column as a support for the ceiling of the barn. This is again a very kind of ordinary functional object, but um, it also is meant to symbolize or sort of remind the viewer of Christ's flagellation. Um, and then we have um, oxen and donkeys. These are meant to symbolize the Gentiles and the Jews. Um, we've got We've got shoes that have been removed from um, the feet of the man standing here to symbolize he's standing on holy ground and so sacred acts are kind of happening. Um, the angels are wearing liturgical gowns to act as Christ's attendants. And, you know, one of the things that was most shocking to the Italians when this arrived um, was how non-idealized the figures are, particularly the shepherds back here. Um, notice the hands have been sort of enlarged, excuse me, um, and they're all sort of pointing towards the Christ child, um, be it, you know, in prayer or kind of in praise. Um, or just in their regular gesture, sort of directing our attention right back to the center and the focal point here. Um, and then we also have this use of hierarchical scale, which kind of speaks to the persistent Gothic influence um, in the Flemish, or excuse me, in the Northern Renaissance style here. Um, the patrons and the the angels, all of these figures are much smaller than the Holy Family, than the Virgin and Joseph, or even the shepherds here. Um, and that, that's meant to sort of symbolize that they are more important to the story. Now, Christ is, you know, not larger than everyone else to signify that he's the most important. However, he's shown as an infant, so he's shown kind of more realistically um, rather than uh, more symbolically in that way.